back to sort of an overview, um, there's a lot of complexity to what goes on at different stages. The collecting duct uh, is where things really get concentrated at the end. That's where, as you go down into the loop of Henle, and you get into this very concentrated um, uh, depth of the uh, medulla right before you are at the pelvis and the, and the ureter. That's where things get really concentrated and, and water gets pumped out. Now, uh, that is set up, that whole concentration gradient is set up by complexity in the loop of Henle, and you have very complex shifts in ion balance and water balance that happen. Uh, different permeabilities and different ion uh, pumps are present at different stages that help set up that. Uh, but I think the key thing to realize is it gets concentrated in the end, uh, final deliverable, the final concentrated urine uh, in the loop. Okay. In terms of the different roles that these different components play, uh, delving into that in more detail, the glomerulus, that's where everything, almost everything gets uh, filtered out initially, formation of what's called the primary urine. And you've got the proximal tubules, loop of Henle, distal tubules, and collecting duct. The proximal tubules have got different components and they reabsorb uh, about two-thirds of the filtrate, glucose and amino acids. Some secretion of uh, organic uh, elements that are secreted like urea and acids. Loop of Henle sets up the concentration mechanism, reabsorbs some of the filtrate. Distal tubules do some reabsorption, and then collecting ducts end up playing a dominant role in, in regulation of sodium and water. So let's talk about the primary urine, and now we're going to get into really close detail on what <coughs> happens uh, right in the middle. This is a, a structure that is um, engaged in the balance. There's a tension between the hydrostatic pressure and uh, gradients that are uh, due to uh, osmotic. Uh, um, got hydrostatic versus osmotic. And that balance sets what's going on in uh, the amount of urine, primary urine that's generated. Okay, and close up, what it looks like is, is this. You've got your lumen or interior of the glomerular capillary. Uh, this is the inside of the blood vessel. And the first thing you notice, there are major holes in the wall, okay? And these are fenestrations or windows. There actually are physical holes which appear nowhere else in the body. Uh, and then there's the basal lamina, that's basically your extra cellular uh, uh, proteoglycans and so on. And then there's another series of holes that let you into Bowman's face, which is collected. Photocytes are the kidney cells that uh, help uh, uh, form the uh, structure of the uh, collecting system. So huge holes, those are there. How big are they? Well, they're just right to keep cells in. And although uh, on the face of it, you wouldn't expect them to keep all proteins in, and they don't. Some proteins can be lost, but they also generate not only a size barrier, but an electrostatic barrier. And, and most proteins are negatively charged, and this is uh, set up likely due to uh, the ion composition of the sort of vestibule of these pores is set up to retain negatively charged uh, elements. A great question. They don't have the sort of regular uh, spacing that like a node of Ranvier has. I don't think uh, there's a, a logic to how far they need to be from each other. Um, so every picture I've seen shows them in a semi-random pattern. The main reason they're there is, is, is just to maintain size and a charge barrier. And those two interact as shown here. And you can test this uh, quantitatively. You can provide uh, different sized molecules, so dextrans, which are basically uh, sugar polymers uh, of different radii. And so this is in angstroms, so we've got 20, 30, 40 angstroms. And if you have a neutral dextran, you can see uh, small ones get through or are freely filtered, no problem. They go right through these holes. As you get to radius, 
you know, about 30 dextrans, it's about 30 angstroms, it's about half uh, uh, retained. And as you get to large, above 40 angstroms radius. But that's neutral. If you're negatively charged, like most proteins are, it's actually even shifted to the left and you retain more. So if you, you actually uh, halfway points around uh, the point. That's the charge plus the size uh, retention. What does that translate into in terms of molecular weight? Well, what it basically means is that if you have a molecular weight of above about five kilodaltons, then you're pretty well retained. And so these are uh, most of the important costly proteins, albumin and so on, that the body uh, expends a lot of uh, metabolic cost to, to generate. Okay, so that's, yeah, that's what's kept things uh, above about 5,000. Okay, so then right away you've got uh, a quantity which is extremely important medically, which is uh, the glomerular, glomerular filtration rate. In particular, you can think about it in terms of the single nephron glomerular filtration rate, uh, SN GFR. And it's set by basically what I mentioned earlier. It's the balance between the hydraulic pressure pushing fluid and the composition of fluid out, and then oncotic pressure, which tends to act to bring it uh, back in. And you can understand why that's the case if you can push out a lot of water, but you're keeping all this, uh, these proteins which have uh, high oncotic pressure and all these cells, uh, you know, eventually there's going to be a driving force for water to come back in. And so you've got this tension between the hydraulic pressure and the oncotic pressure. And then there's uh, just a scaling factor, which of course, could be set, importantly, by various things. If you have damage to your kidneys, big fenestrations, big openings, well, that's certainly going to affect your filtration technique. You've got these different parameters, and it's a pretty useful, simple way of, of uh, thinking about it. This also varies, though, depending whether you're at the early or the late stage of the arterial. And you can understand why that's the case, too. The hydrostatic pressure might not be that different. It's an arterial at the beginning and end. It might drop a little, but you're going to have a big change as it's progressing through that tuft and then getting to come out the other end. Well, that's when all the fluid is coming out, and so you're going to have a higher, toward the end, higher oncotic pressure differential toward the end. And so that's exactly what happens at the start of the arterial, the afferent arterial. You've got a net filtration, the pressure is winning over the oncotic pressure, but by the end of the arterial, by the end of that tuft as you're getting ready to leave and the parent arterial, they're pretty well balanced at the end and so there's not much filtration going on. And you can think about that uh, quantitatively, the pressure, the hydraulic pressure breaks down into the pressure differential between the, what's in the glomerular capillary and the Bowman's capsule, usually about 10 millimeters of mercury. Uh, and then as you get to the end, the oncotic pressure breaks down into the same thing, glomerular ultra, ultra filtrate oncotic pressure, um, and uh, mostly uh, uh, water, so it's a shadow break. And here's what I was talking about earlier. It's the difference between the afferent and the efferent. By the time you get to the end, things are pretty well balanced and there's not much net filtration. Things are set up that way. Uh, at, least. So at the beginning, there is a net force driving contents of the glomerular capillary. Now, as I mentioned, the, that hydrostatic pressure more or less remains constant. The big change is in the oncotic pressure with distance along the capillary. Um, one way to, to, to graphically represent this and to think about it is what's shown here. Um, and what's plotted here is the oncotic or osmotic pressure of the glomerular colloid, what's actually uh, present out in the uh, filtrate. And what you actually see as you go along the glomerular capillary, you actually end up, uh, if you have a normal process, you look like this. If you have decreased filtration, the curve is shifted down. If you have increased filtration, 